Hello everyone. Hope you are having a great day. Thank you for joining Latest DevCon. A little bit introduction about myself. I'm Ashish Bansal, working with Latest Semiconductor. I'm leading the global charter for 5G comms uh, architecture and strategy, and I'm joined by my fellow speakers today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. I'm Mamta Gupta. I am the Director of Marketing for Strategic Business Development. Uh, I lead the security, telecom, and data center BUs at Lattice. Pleasure to be here. And I'm Doug Gardner. I'm with Analog Devices, uh, and I'm one of the security architects there. Hello, I am Hussam Fattah. So I'm working in the application engineering, and I'm leading the ORAN stack uh, work and uh, that cover the ORAN and 5G. Okay, thank you everybody for the introduction. So today we will be talking about the uh, designing, our topic is uh, designing with ORAN solution stack from Lattice, and we'll be talking about the ORAN global market. We'll be looking into the stack overview, what has been introduced by uh, Lattice and what's coming next. And then we'll be looking into ORAN Alliance security from our expert, uh, Doug Gardner. And then we'll be diving into the PTP 1588 requirements, which is critical for uh, 5G ORAN networks. And then we'll get into the Q&A. So there is a Q&A widget. Uh, you'll see that in your uh, um, screen. And you can ask questions. And we'd like to go over the questions following our presentation. Love to uh, get as many questions as possible. Uh, so let's dive in. So this is our uh, introduction. Like in the starting slide, we are talking about or an overview. We're talking about the industri industry trends uh, happening for ORAN and the 5G. We're looking into the disruption, what ORAN has introduced. We look into the comms compute converger, convergence, which is exp over expanding role of data centers, white box hardware, and infrastructures needed for the deployment of uh, communication networks or wireless. We look into hyperscalers being active in the 5G and telco race. And then, of course, we got some updates, news updates for around the world about the ORAN and uh, what's happening and excitement is still building on. So what's happening in the communication industry development? Well, that's where we get started. We are seeing comms compute convergence, which is uh, your com com communication workloads and your wireless protocols, network functions are actually implemented now uh, on, uh, um, on the white box hardware, general purpose hardware. And uh, similar to what IT workloads have been implemented earlier. So this is a, a, one of the biggest mega trend happening along with the disaggregation of the open RAN, uh, which actually introduces uh, security as one of the main critical things. And then another mega trend which we are uh, seeing is the small cells and uh, private networks, advent of private networks, uh, which is getting realized. Then we are getting into of course, we know about the expansion of 5G deployment. Uh, we are looking at ex uh, all the telcos which have implemented the 5G. They are now working on the densification of the 5G services, either through the sub-6 or look, they are looking at millimeter wave uh, to expand the 5G. Then we are looking into smart cities. Uh, what we have also seen, and actually all the hyperscalers coming closer to the telco networks and all the workloads uh, Actually, in, uh, some of the workloads which are critical are migrated to the cloud. All of this has been driven by higher bandwidth needs, uh, either because it's a next generation B2B services, enterprise connectivity, uh, or uh, self-driving cars and industry 4.0, where you have to connect the machines. Growth in the streaming services, gaming, applications, and IoT. Why uh, we are just, uh, like what we are doing so far, we are also seeing the challenges uh, because of this disaggregation, because of this uh, mega trends which is happening in the industry around the evolving requirements. And so, government are putting more pressure and regulations around the disaggregation because now you have the increased attack surface. So, now uh, we are seeing more and more scrutiny from the government regulations like HC, NISA. NISA and 3GPP in Europe, and of course, federal agencies in US and other regulatory bodies around the world. So this, uh, we, are, we have to be more careful with the networks now uh, because they are getting more attack surface. So, uh, and then of course, uh, one of the other bigger considerations is around the power and space 
which is very critical for the next generation uh, design of the networks. So uh, we'll quickly look into the evolution of the RAN, uh, where we started with the traditional RAN, which was all one black box uh, proprietary hardware coupled with the software hardware in one, in one big box. But now we saw the first level disaggregation uh, where the, it was virtualized, still the same vendor, but the software and hardware was decoupled. And that was the first level of disaggregation. What we are seeing now, the biggest disruption in the industry uh, in the any wireless technologies happening happened so far is the ORAN, which is the open RAN, which we are opening up these interfaces, opening up and making them interoperable. So we are bringing the best in the breach solutions uh, from, from the players out there. This is to avoid vendor lock-in, and we are uh, going for a encouragement of the innovation and, of course, to drive down the cost. So these have been the benefits of what has been the legacy design compared to what is the ORAN design. We are looking at, of course, the monolithic architecture is going away. Uh, we are uh, bringing the courts general purpose hardware. Uh, we are uh, moving away from the proprietary designs uh, of the silicon and uh, more basing it on the ORAN OCP standards uh, for, for hosting this um, uh, telco stacks. Then we are coming in with the uh, standards and open APIs like what has been done in ORAN Alliance with the front hall, uh, 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 front hall interface between the RU and DU. And then of course we are remo removing the uh, coupling of the hardware and proprietary features uh, with no interoperability and uh, publishing all the standards. So this is the benefit. And then at the end, all of this is actually giving, well, you know, like uh, opportunity for the developers and innovators uh, for the innovation. So let's let's step back, look into why, where we are, we are, where we are seeing the expansion of 5G infrastructure. So, uh, we are actually currently, currently around 30 to 40% covered globally, uh, 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 on the 5G. What we are going to see next couple of years is going to be very critical for the rollout of 5G network. And as a matter of fact, we are 2026 is going to be a 50 billion uh, uh, 5G market um, uh, for the for the in networks. Uh, let's look also into uh, the ORAN. ORAN was uh, um, has been uh, quite a buzzword for the last many years. But ORAN, we saw 2022 was one of the major uh, milestone year for the for the graduation of the ORAN where DISH uh, uh, in the US and of course Rakuten in uh, Japan has launched the first uh, ORAN network. Similar to that, now we are seeing that market size, lot and lot other telcos, which we'll see momentarily, are catching up on the ORAN race. And there is going to be a huge market coming up, which is predicted to be around 22 billion uh, by 2028. So let's look into some of those news. Uh, Airtel uh, did the first 5G ORAN uh, validation trial. Then there has been uh, NEC is expanding the one of the one of the OEMs expanding to cover more uh, radios which are ORAN compliant. And then uh, so this are the global footprint of the ORAN operate orient technology being used by the uh, telcos worldwide and what they are focusing on and we see this map actually now kind of expanding to a lot of other areas where the oran has been trialed we talk about vodafone being active in very active in the oran commercial pilots in germany and actually very recently vodafone announced that they are going to be releasing a big site tender where ORAN is going to be one of the significant main player of the technology the, uh, they'll provide in the network. And then of course there was a US uh, Chip Spending Act, or so CHIP Act, where uh, US want to spend and uh, 1.5 billion for the alternatives and make in and promote the open RAN innovation. And then of course, uh, provide more security uh, to the networks, which was a concern from some of the other uh, vendors which were out there. With that, I will pass it this to Mamta Gupta to talk about the uh, ORAN stack overview. Thanks, Ashish. If you could go to the next slide. Yeah, so Lattice is very well known in the industry for our low power FPGAs, uh, where we provide high security and uh, 
you know, a very good set of features that are applicable across all segments. So in addition to providing FPGAs to the market, we layer on specific solutions on top of them so that customers can quickly go in and uh, solve their problems. So some of the markets that we are actively providing solutions for are, of course, the communication market for 5G, wireless, switches, routers. This is the focus of our today's talk. But as part of this Lattice Developer Conference, you would be seeing multiple um, uh, applications being discussed for computing, industrial, automate, automotive, and consumer. And with this vertical focus, this is where we came up with the ORAN solution stack, which addresses the all the trends that Ashish talked about. Next slide, please. So the whole focus is on enabling ORAN deployment. We recognize the trend, we recognize the need, and we recognize the threats and challenges and of course, as uh, Ashish Mentor mentioned, uh, with the disaggregation and openness and with multiplayer ecosystem uh, and with the increased threat surface, you need security. So increased security is a big um, requirement. And of course, the solutions have to address that. And then, of course, the easiest way to mess up uh, you know, any network is to mess up with the synchronization. So continuing the security story and also keeping in mind the various pieces of a disaggregated network uh, have to be synchronized, have to be tightly coupled. Um, so one of the offerings in the stack would be uh, synchronization solutions starting with 1588, that was Sam will cover later, and going on to other technologies uh, which are very ORAN specific like eCPRI. And Everything is underpinned by the need for low power. So green telecom, secure green telecom is the rallying cry for the industry. And with our FPGAs and their native low power architectures, we provide low power acceleration to implement solutions like MaxSec. And they are also knit into the ORAN stack. We take a phased approach. We attack the first, you know, high very high priority items, and we roll them out. So this is a train of events that happens in a solution stack. And I'm going to take you through the um, architecture of a stack, and then Hussam later will be diving deep into the 1588 solution. Um, next slide. So this was our ORAN 1.0 release that we released in uh, 2022. Uh, or was it 20? Yeah, that was 2022. That was our first uh, release that came out. And our focus was security. The main trend that we are seeing is that people are very conscious about securing their endpoints. The SOCs have pretty good security. They have root of trust features in them, and they are considered safe. But the channels of communication between them, they need to be secured. So we saw the need to secure the wire. Wherever messages are being exchanged, uh, interactions are happening between SOCs or various endpoints, you need to have security in place. And most of the time it takes the um, nature of encryption and authentication. And sometimes as simple as a different crypto key length could leave vulnerability in there because two SOCs cannot really send encrypted messages because they have different key length support. So you need to secure the wire either through a crypto bridge or there might be a, you know, a prior generation SOC sitting there which may not be addressing certain security concerns. So you may have to bolster the security with a symbiont root of trust. So that is the need of the hour to, to secure the wire. And the other need that regulators are uh, pushing down especially Etsy and ESA, they are big on zero trust security. What is zero trust security? It's an, it sounds like an oxymoron, but what it really means is that, look, I, if you are within my perimeter, still I don't trust you. You have to show me your credentials at all times. So it is perimeter-less security, which is very apt for an ORAN-like disaggregated uh, infrastructure or architecture. So... Our ORAN 1.0 solution implements both uh, securing the wire, we secure the PCIe channel, actually PCIe SIG 
has um, uh, published uh, a paper that is very, very analogous to our solution uh, on how we secure the PCIe uh, channel between the host CPU and rest of the system so that endpoints cannot be spoofed, the messages are encrypted, no man in the middle, and then authentication for integrity protection and uh, uh, basically identity protection as well. So it implements zero trust. And, uh, and it's not only for data in transit, it's actually at every state of data use, uh, in use, in transit, at rest, we address all use cases through our ORAN 1.0 um, release. And next slide, please. So as I talked about, Lattice has been in the comms business for a very long time, and we are ubiquitous in various control applications. Um, we are very well known for power control, so hardware management, IO expansion, power management. And then now as comms compute convergence is happening and telcos are being um, implemented in uh, data centers, we are increasingly being used as hardware root of trust to provide platform security. So we are increasingly pro providing what we call secure control. And that concept is what we have used, that capability of a hardware root of trust uh, is what we have used in our ORAN stack to come up with this secure the wire solution uh, that our regulatory bodies are asking for. No longer just software security is enough or a virtual machine can be secured. No, you need to root your security in a hardware, silicon hardware or some hardware, and then you bubble the trust up from that foundational level to implement your uh, zero security and multi-level trust in, in the network. Next slide, please. Here is a quick overview of what a stack looks like when we say a stack. So this is a very common picture between various stacks. Uh, we always would have a board. We would have corresponding IP cores, software tools, giving the support for this, reference designs, and then custom, and de custom design services to implement this according to your needs. And Lattice ORAN uh, stack both for security and for 1588, the later 1.1 release that we had, has the same structure. You get the same services and tools and IPs so that you can hit the ground running and implement these applications. Next. So this is the, um, uh, these are the tools that come with it. We have the, the whole solution is implemented on a software 5. You can configure. Um, the SDK, and then uh, Lattice Propel is our IP tool, and Lattice Radiant is our uh, very famous, uh, famous for its uh, in intuitiveness in its design service and, uh, sorry, interface and uh, ease of use for uh, creating the configuration file. Next, please. So I'll wrap up. Uh, basically, we take the, the, we implement these solution stacks on our FPGAs um, that are really low power, up to 75% low, lower power than you know competition in their class. Very small form factor. You know, board space is always, always a challenge. 90% smaller form factor. High security, hardware-based security. No longer virtual machine or software-based security. Hardware-based security. Instant on performance. Um, remember, as I said. We do the hardware platform management. We do power control. We are the first on, last off. So instant on power performance. And then about 100x lower SER, so very high reliability availability for uh, radiation tolerance and uh, performance. So with this, I will transition to Doug, who will take us through what Aura and Alliance is up to in working group 11. Doug. So hello, I'm Doug Gardner from Analog Devices. Um, next slide. Please. So who is Analog Devices? Uh, basically, we sense, we measure, we connect, we power, we interpret, and we secure. Um, we have uh, five major uh, business unit areas, uh, automotive, communications, healthcare, industrial control systems, and energy, and consumer. Um, so we are where data is born. It's where the real world meets the digital world. The sensors turn into digits that then become the rest of the system and in our new digital world. Um, and uh, basically we make all the things below there, analog mixed signal sensors, processing algorithms, 
Uh, next slide. So, so let's talk about the ORAN Alliance. Um, I am on the work group 11 of the uh, ORAN Alliance, and I'm gonna basically just give a, a spotlight on the security aspect, but here's the overall mission of ORAN. And you can see there, uh, the top left, you have the openness. Everything used to be proprietary, now it's all open. You have the virtualization, where we're virtualizing the, the network, and you're adding intelligence to make better decisions, smart decisions, machine learning, and interoperability. Um, the three main trusts, thrusts that we're working on uh, basically are creating specifications. Um, and we, uh, we have 11 working groups of which WG11 is just one in this organization. Um, the second thrust is for testing integration and certification, right? As you start to open up these uh, interfaces, you also have to have some type of integration and certification to prove the plug and play is going to work. And then we also want to have in testing to prove that the requirements, for example, like the security requirements have been implemented and people have not left them out of their design so that the customer can make good decisions. And then we're also setting up a open source software community that's gonna collaborate and add functionality. So it's really a, an opening of the whole uh, ORAN environment. Uh, next slide, please. So in this openness and disaggregation, right? It has positive and negatives on the security. Um, you know, the, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been doing the threat analysis, going through, looking at all the different assets, um, what is important to reduce, what's not. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, all those boxes that make up our architecture, um, basically only one of them, the ORU, has to be physical. All the rest can be virtualized. Um, you can choose to have a cell site that has an ODU local in the cell site, surrounded by fences and protections, just like it used to be or you could decide to shove the ORU up into the cloud. Um, and that's what the OAN Alliance is about, is virtualizing everything that we can and adding flexibility. Uh, next slide, please. So what's driving things right now, right? It's, it's this hyper-connectivity. Um, basically, the world is changing, we're interconnecting. Uh, before you design systems, those systems were designed typically by a single company. Um, now you have multiple systems being designed by multiple companies. You're, you're connecting them on the same networks. You're sharing data. And basically at the system of systems views, you're, you're getting unanticipated changes and disruptions um, and lowering of costs. And that, that picture on the first picture on the left, well, the right side, but on the left side of the right side, um, you know, you have your sensors, you have your nodes, you have gateways, you have servers, you have clouds. You have this whole hierarchy of how the information can flow in your system, whether it's localized or whether it goes all the way up to the cloud. And one of the things that this does is you can't treat your networks as trusted anymore. So you really have to move to the zero trust architecture, right? And what, what does that really mean? It means that you have to control access to everything. You have to uh, authenticate who you're connecting to, right? If I'm an edge sensor, I have to know how many people are connecting to me. Am I willing to connect to them? What kind of data am I willing to share with them? Am I willing to take commands from them? And so you have to follow that zero trust architecture where you have identity and you authenticate, mutually authenticate everything in your network. Um, the other thing is that you have machine learning and AI taking more and more of a role where machines are making decisions. Those decisions are made on the data. Um, there's no more human in the loop. So you have to be very careful that you're using trusted data. Um, you, if you don't have trusted data, then you're gonna have bad, uh, you know, bad, uh, um, you don't trust your data, you're going to basically make bad decisions. And without the human in the loop, that can be dangerous. So we need to create trusted data. And what that means is we need to have data that has a source of identity. Um, and we have to have a, a integrity checks. So you have to know that the data making it through your system is worth making decisions on and, and keep out the bad actors. Um, the other item, which has already been mentioned, and that is that right security needs to be rooted in the immutable silicon. Uh, if you looked at the picture one over from the right side, uh, basically you see that you have the hardware root of trust and then you basically have to create a chain of trust from that, right? When the security starts when something powers on, not when the software is done loading and everything's running. And so we really have to work on how that secure, uh, immutable silicon root of trust is chained up into the rest of the virtual world and maintain that uh, identity 
and authentication uh, to all the data so everyone can make the proper decisions at the proper levels. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the state of the security today, you can see here that those are the list of the customers that are driving the ORAN, all the major telcos across the world. Um, and, and reality is the customers drive the requirements. And I think with the way the world is changing, the governments and the operators are both starting to take more seriously all the requirements. In the past, the vendors took care of the security and they had claims of physical isolation. They had interfaces they didn't have to publish, so they had obscurity. And now all that's changing, right? Because we are now defining open interfaces and all that openness needs to have, uh, you know, needs to have added security, right? Because we're exposing interfaces that weren't exposed prior. Things that were between an ODU and an RU didn't have to have, didn't have to have publicly accessible networks connected. Right. If you just if now in today's world, you could decide to run that across an open network. And of course, you'd want security on that <laughs> without any doubt. So today's security, right, is 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 mutual authentication, zero architecture. Um, as we keep virtualizing everything, obviously, the, the security of the software and the importance of software continues to grow. Um, the other element is you always still have this edge and you need that intelligence at the edge and the security at the edge to do the authentication and to make sure you're connecting to the cloud and you're not letting the wrong things into the network because the edge also is an entry point back into the rest of the network. So you really need some smarts at that edge. Uh, and then of course, it's all about risk management, right? You have to do your threat assessments, your assets and, and, and really secure by design, not band-aided on later. Uh, next slide, please. Our, our activities right now, uh, basically, we're WG11 defines the security requirements across all the groups. Uh, today, we have 13 specifications we've released. Examples are the security protocols and, and requirements documents. We've had seven versions. We have 12 active working items within our uh, WG11, and we're doing everything from defining security testing to securing the front hall. Uh, you can see all the bullets there. There's a lot of work going on. Uh, next slide. So, the future trends. Right, we, we basically have the commercial and the consumer world. Um, everyone loves to add sensors to their houses, uh, cameras, you name it, right? And, and one of the driver forces there is the ease of use. And then you add to that the machine learning and enhancements and the amount of processing that can be done by some of these basically allows you to do automation of tasks and to really make things simple. Um, but some of the obstacles that we're gonna run into, and that is, Right now, the sensor generation, the trajectory, basically it's growing. Our ability of generating data is exceeding the rate of processing power increase. So what that means is in 2032, we will be able to generate more data than we can ever process in the entire world's processing power. Obviously, that, that doesn't make much sense. Um, but there is also an imbalance on the communication channels. Um, again, the data generation trajectory exceeds all possible communication capabilities. If the, if the, at the current trajectory rate of the communications expansion. So what does that really mean? It means we're, we're driving to the point where we have to have smart, intelligent edge devices. You have to process the data there, only send up the data that's valuable and make sure it's trusted data. Uh, you also have government trends where the governments are requiring compliance. And you can see that in both the US and the EU and other countries. And then you have the insurance companies that uh, are throwing things in there and the insurance companies basically are not going to give you insurance if you don't have proper security in a lot of your high tech companies. And next slide, please. So in conclusion, you know, laws and money and governments drive change, right? The customer has to value. Um, as we open up these interfaces, it's great. We no longer have obscurity, but we now have to secure it using things like zero trust and authentication. Um, end of the day, the customer has to value security, right? It has to be part of their uh, selection criteria. If they don't value it, then it, 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 it will basically uh, be the cheapest provider prevails and not necessarily have security rooted in immutable silicon. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thanks, Doug, for uh, covering and providing a great overview of ORAN Alliance uh, work, Working Group 11. I'll pass it to Hossam to talk about Lattice ORAN uh, 1.1 1, uh, 1 .1 solution stack and talk about, uh, take us into 1588 world as well. Thank you, Thank you, Ashish. Hello, everyone. Um, let's, uh, I will be covering the new Lattice ORAN version 1.1 solution stack, which is known as IEEE 
88 precision timing protocol with provide tight synchronization and very secure. So I will cover, I will start by uh, uh, covering uh, what feature from the IEEE 1588 BTB and the different ITU T profile uh, implemented and included in this solution stack. Then I will go over the reference design, the hardware kit, the evaluation kit, how to uh, how to operate the hardware and the software that uh, run with this hardware. And then we'll cover some performance test result and see the accuracy of time, frequency, and phase of this solution stack. So what is, uh, what is this solution stack about? This solution stack provide a very tight synchronization and secure. And when we talk about synchronization, it's synchronization in time, in frequency, and in phase. So it, it provides high precision timing uh, solution because it, uh, it works using the IEEE 1588, which provide um, uh, an accuracy up to the nanosecond accuracy. So this solution stack is class C, and uh, which means its accuracy is less than uh, 10 nanosecond, which is very tight uh, accuracy to be used in ORAN and 5G application. Uh, it's also secure. Uh, you see Mamta and Doug talk about uh, the increasing threat from uh, security around us and uh, the cyber security need to be implemented in ORAN. And this solution come ready with uh, mutual authentication, integrity and verification, and uh, ready for uh, which uh, for implementing uh, the cyber security uh, needs. Uh, third, it's it's highly resilient in terms of uh, it support um, uh, if there is any network degradation or failure in the network, the solution stack uh, will continue to work accurately, provide the accurate time and frequency and phase. Despite that, the surrounding uh, circumstances uh, is in uh, error. Uh, as Mamta mentioned, we combined this solution stack with Lattice FBGA, and as a result, it, it's very low power consumption, can run on battery power devices for so long time. Uh, it's ready if, uh, and support the ORAN alliance requirement uh, in terms of the different split option, uh, the low layer split, the high layer split, and it support, of course, the 3GBB technical specification requirement. It's also ready for mobile edge computing and can be used for virtualized uh, RAN, um, uh, Internet of Things, uh, ultra reliable and low latency communication, and so on. So uh, what is uh, what is uh, 1588? IEEE 1588 is a protocol released by IEEE and it only uh, provide time synchronization. On top of this protocol, which is implemented uh, uh, in, on Lattice FBGA, the solution stack also support other ITUT profile. Uh, one profile, for example, uh, to achieve frequency synchronization. Another profile, 8275.1, uh, which achieve phase and time synchronization when all the nodes support the same profile, which we call it full-time support from the network. Another profile, 8275.2, which support phase and time synchronization when not all the node uh, doesn't support the same profile, which we call it partial time support. And eventually, one of the important profile distribution stack support is the time-sensitive network. And this is the IEEE 802.1ES, which is a time-sensitive network profile used in time-sensitive network. And uh, uh, time-sensitive network is an essential part now of the 5G technology. It hasn't existed in the 4G but it's now part of the ORAN and 5G and time-sensitive network has uh, a huge number of uh, applications that is required to run on the 5G. Uh, the solution stack run on a number of uh, clock and nodes. Uh, some clock uh, called, for example, Grandmaster clock, boundary clock. Uh, we have some uh, clock uh, called boundary, um, uh, boundary clock, uh, some other clock uh, called transparent clock. So all of these, like um, this diagram can explain it. So we can have, for example, a grandmaster uh, distributing the time to other boundary clock, uh, which act as a master and a slave at the same time. And the boundary clock will redistribute the time and frequency and phase synchronization to downstream other clock and so on to cover synchronization in a big area of network. So the solution stack come ready with a big list of compliance uh, and the profile uh, from ITU to, uh, from ITU supported. One of these, uh, uh, like this list of profiles supported in the solution stack is, for example, the 8273, which is a framework of phase and time clock. Uh, another profile, 8273.2 and 3, 
which explain the boundary clock and the slave clock and transparent clock behavior uh, in full time support network. Another profile, uh, 8273.4, which uh, also describe the behavior and compliance requirement uh, of a telecom boundary clock in partial uh, uh, support from the network. Uh, most importantly, uh, two other profile, 8262 and 8262.1, uh, which is used for what we call synchronous Ethernet. And synchronous Ethernet is a very important physical layer signal used to achieve frequency and phase synchronization. And it has a great uh, use, a great implication in ORAN equipment and so on. And these two profiles is fully supported in the uh, ORAN solution stack. Uh, the, this is the profile. Let's quickly go over this profile. The uh, first profile supported uh, by this solution stack is 8265.1, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it used to distributed frequency. It used to achieve frequency synchronization, and it support only one type of clocks, uh, what we call slave only ordinary clock. Uh, this profile uses a synchronous Ethernet signal to achieve uh, the frequency synchronization in addition to the normal time synchronization that can be achieved by the IEEE 1588. Another profile is uh, 8275.1, which is also a profile used, but for phase and time synchronization with full time support. It works directly over L2 or Ethernet frame. It's not uh, running on top of IB. And it also uses a sync E uh, to achieve uh, both time, frequency, and phase synchronization. Third profile is the 8275.2, which is also a profile used for phase and time distribution but it work on top of IB layer. It doesn't work on Ethernet directly. And um, um, uh, the use of Sync E in this profile is optional because it's a partial uh, network support, meaning that not all the node uh, can support the same profile. Uh, in this diagram, you see the black arrow is, is a distribution of the time through the IEEE 1588 uh, precision timing protocol. And the red uh, line is a distribution of the Sync E signal, uh, which uh, can add a layer of uh, achieving frequency and phase synchronization to the network. Now, time sensitive network is an essential part of the solution stack and the solution stack fully support time sensitive network. In terms of 5G, 5G now is also ready to support time sensitive network. So on, on one side of the network, you, we have a time sensitive network that can have different clock type, like a grandmaster clock, um, some in the station or some bridge and the 5G core network sub, uh, implement now what we call uh, network side that uh, TSN translator. So it translates the traffic of the uh, uh, time sensitive network to a traffic that the 5G system will understand. Inside the, uh, inside the 5G system, we we'll run the base station, the ORAN, the 5G uh, core network, like the user plan function, and the uh, handheld device, like the user equipment or the iPhone. So the time sensitive network uh, traffic will go through the 5G system and will go to another device. We call it device side TSN translator will translate the traffic back to another, to the same time sensitive network residing on the other end of the network. So now we have achieved a full time, uh, time sensitive network over the 5G uh, island um, and it's fully uh, now a time sensitive network fully working over 5G network. And different application of time sensitive network appear nowadays in uh, industrial automation, car manufacturing, remote health, uh, remote surgery, um, um, uh, uh, public safety like uh, police, uh, uh, police ambulance, and uh, uh, law enforcement. So all of these uh, using a time sensitive network and the solution stack is now ready to support this kind of uh, application. Now let's go quickly over the reference design in terms of the hardware and software used in this solution stack. So uh, the solution stack with all these profile you have seen is fully implemented and embedded on Lattice FBGA. So um, like the architecture of the of the different module on the FBGA is, is, is very big. I will just touch quickly on the important module, which is uh, one module, for example, the timestamp unit, which um, uh, stamp the bucket with a certain timestamp and bars incoming packet, there is an embedded risk vCPU that run the whole IEEE 1588 protocol and all the ITU profile and time sensitive network profile. We have also an embedded TCB stack that run the UDB, IB version 4, IB version 6, and so on. 
In addition, we have a, a, a BDL phase lock loop that have uh, four inputs, so the timing source can come from satellite through a GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite System. It can come from a crystal oscillator. It can come from synchronous Ethernet physical signal, or it can come from an arbitrary um, external frequency input. Uh, maybe the user or the use case require an, another external frequency uh, for as a time source, so it, it's, it's possible and accommodated in the hardware architecture. Uh, this is a protocol stack of the solution stack. So we have both the risk va and the FBGA completely embedded on the FBGA. And on top, we have a Linux-based uh, GUI application that the user can use to monitor, configure, and set up and control the FBGA board as different type of clock. It, for example, you can sit, use it to set the um, FBGA board as a grandmaster clock, boundary clock, ordinary clock, transparent clock, or any other kind of profile. And uh, it communicates uh, with the FBGA through a UART uh, interface. And then on the, on the FBGA, we have, the um, we have an engine, we call it a BTB uh, engine, which runs the full implementation of the IEEE 1588 protocol stack and the ITU profile and the time sensitive network stack. Then all of these run on, uh, on top of an embedded TCB IB stack that run UDB, IB version 4, IB version 6, and Ethernet. And then we have some IB, uh, lattice IB that uh, implement the 1588, especially the timestamp unit. And eventually it run on top of uh, Ethernet uh, interface, 10 gigabit uh, file interface as well. So this is uh, how the, uh, we have an evaluation kit that is ready. The user can use it completely to implement uh, the scenario required, uh, whether uh, an OAM or ODM or a general purpose user uh, the board is ready to uh, run any of these IEEE 1588 precision timing protocol or the ITU profile. One board is a motherboard, um, and as you see, it, it has a 2 uh, 10 gigabit interface, 2 1 gigabit interface. It has a USB type uh, B uh, for flashing the firmware, uh, configuring the board. It has an FMC connector, and more importantly, it has a BCIE edge connector, which also uh, can fit into a BCIE slot and uh, can be used in a BCIE interface uh, uh, computer or um, or a computer system. Uh, this is uh, in, uh, um, in, in the middle of the board, uh, powered by Lattice FBGA, uh, Certus Pro NX, which is extremely low power, uh, low, uh, small in size, and efficiently uh, in, uh, uh, implement all these protocol stack uh, in high in uh, high accuracy in time frequency and phase. So the second board is the daughter board, and this daughter board carry all the timing signal. Uh, so this daughter board uh, carry uh, the BLL in um, uh, in a chip uh, from uh, we call it network clock synchronizer, uh, and we have another chip uh, that is a, a crystal oscillator, and then it has a built. Uh, we have a GNS timing model where you can get the time source from a GPS or satellite. And then there is other two boards uh, where the user can use to get, for example, the time of day signal or uh, one BBS, which is a one pulse per second. Uh, so the daughter board has an FMC card that get uh, hooked into the motherboard. So the BLL, as I said, it has four input, uh, one from uh, um, Crystal Oscillator, one from syn syn Synchronous Ethernet, one from GNSS and one for external frequency input and provide eight output. The eight output go to the Certus Pro FBGA where the uh, exact logic inside the FBGA will, will use the, uh, the more accurate, the more stable timing source uh, to provide time and frequency and phase synchronization. Uh, now um, the two boards uh, are connected together through the FMC connector uh, and you see the daughter board and the mother board connected together and then they can be connected through um, a USB cable uh, to a Linux uh, BC running the Linux GUI, where now you can um, uh, set up and configure the board, for example, to run as a default profile, IEEE 1588 default profile, or to run it as an IT, uh, ITU 8265.1 profile for frequency synchronization, or uh, to run the profile for time sensitive network. And then uh, from here, you can uh, connect uh, the, the FBGA board or the, uh, to act as a clock, 
feeding time and frequency and phase synchronization to other devices in the network. Uh, security is very important. Like Mamta mentioned about secure, and security is one essential part in latest solution stack. So this solution stack uh, uh, is secure and have security mechanism to mutually authenticate the different clock types. So we have different clock now in the network communicated with each other and to prevent uh, uh, to prevent um, like uh, any th security threat uh, and to uh, increase uh, cyber security. So uh, the different node can mutually authenticate each other. Uh, we have also integrity and check and verification. So how the security mechanism work? There is a key management and distribution procedure uh, implemented in that solution stack that distributed the key, uh, the shared secret or a, or a shared secret key to all nodes where they use this key to compute an authentication uh, type lens value field that is inserted into the BTB bucket. Uh, and uh, also the integrity check verification value field will be computed based on that shared key. And then uh, the two bucket will uh, start exchanging the BTB message, mutually authenticate each other and integrity verify all the BTB message. So that's highly secure and also comply with IEEE 1588 security requirement and the ORAN Alliance security requirement. Now, uh, performance. Uh, the performance is very high and very precise in this solution stack. Uh, uh, we use an industry uh, leading equipment for testing the solution stack. So uh, we, uh, in this uh, performance test result we achieve on the solution stack, we use a Bragon Neo tester for which is um, an industry leading equipment for testing timing solution. Uh, and this is a device you see here, this is its GUI. And here we have uh, our evaluation kit or the hardware hooked, uh, connected to a two fiber optics cable, uh, 10 gigabit uh, fiber optics to the tester. And then let's see the test result. So uh, this is only a snapshot of the test uh, uh, or compliance test result we run. So we achieve, for example, one of the compliance requirements required by, I, by ITU called 8273.2, which is a full timing uh, support compliance requirement. And these are a number of test cases that the solution support, for example, noise generation, uh, which uh, indicate how much noise the device will generate if it's provided with an ideal input. Uh, we have noise tolerance, which is the maximum uh, noise at the input that can be tolerated by the device and device will continue to work accurately in providing a time, phase and frequency synchronization. And we have a noise transfer. If we have a noise on the BTB input, how the noise will be transferred to the output in terms of BTB output or sync E output. And transit is one. So all these test cases are passing. Uh, now, if we go quickly to the class C accuracy, we see here the time error getting from the device and we will notice that the time error is almost 4.8 nanoseconds. The target by the ITU is to be less than 30 nanoseconds. So the solution stack indeed is much lower than what is required by the ITU, and thus it comply with class C and even better than the class C requirement. Uh, this is the average time error. It shows that an average time error, uh, time error of almost 1.8 nanoseconds, which is less than the target uh, mandated, which is 10 nanoseconds. So it's much lower than the 10 nanoseconds. Finally, we have the dynamic time error. It's also uh, less than uh, 10 nanosecond. Uh, you see here in the two-way dynamic um, um, maximum time interval error, uh, the blue line is what we get from the solution stack. The green line is what the ITU mandate. You see the solution stack is much better and lower, um, higher accuracy than what the ITU require. Finally, I mean, we have some noise. This is a noise, uh, um, uh, this is a noise transfer for uh, the noise transfer uh, test, and you see uh, the output uh, at the sync E or BTB is conforming uh, to the ITU requirement and within the required margin. Uh, finally, we talk about the resilience and holdover, which is when one of the uh, input synchronization signal is lost, the device will continue to work uh, normally and provide accurate phase and time and uh, uh, frequency synchronization. And you see here, uh, the input is, uh, is, is, is lost at the input, but the device continue to work and provide accurate timing at the output, and it's below what the ITU require uh, by this green line. So uh, the, in terms of resiliency, it, it's, it's, uh, it has high and very good uh, resilience. 
uh, like as Mamta mentioned, uh, it's combined with uh, lattice FBGA, low power, small size, high efficiency, and uh, this is uh, lattice ORAN version 1.1 solution stack. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for the deep insight about the 1588 solution. And I hope the developers and architects from the bigger community of OEMs, ODMs vendors, uh, can actually leverage some of the recent developments from Lattice. Uh, uh, we are getting some questions, so maybe we'll go to the Q&A. Let me go to the widget and see the questions coming up. So we have got the first question, uh, which is, uh, I think, very fresh to what 1588 uh, talk was about. Uh, what are some of the uh, use cases and applications where 1588 would be uh, uh, leveraged? And I think this question, maybe, Hussain, you can address. That. Okay, sure. Thank you, Ashish. Yes. Now, uh, for the first time in 5G, as you know, the ORAN, as you mentioned, uh, Ashish, and as Mamta and Doug mentioned, the ORAN is disaggregated now, meaning that the, the ORAN is divided into a small pieces of equipment. Like we have what we call the radio unit. We have the distributed unit. We have the central unit. And each equipment is done by different manufacturer and different vendor. And we have what we call even the split option. So we have a split option 7.2 where the, the radio unit can be split in half, one low fi one high fi And this also, the ORAN come virtualized. It can be deployed in the cloud where one piece of the, of the ORAN will be deployed on edge, cloud edge. Another piece of the ORAN will be deployed in the cloud central. So now because of this, this aggregation, this unit need a time source. They need a single device that provide a single time source to all these equipment of the ORAN. And that's why we need a very tight synchronization in the ORAN. Not only that, but in a split option 7.2, where it in, divide the file layer into low fi high fi Now, the, what interchange between them is a, a RF waveform in terms of the I and Q sample. And this is output from the analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter. So this doesn't need just a time synchronization. It needs a frequency and phase synchronization so that the distributed unit can demodulate, uh, convert this IQ sample back into, um, um, into the, the, the waveform, the 5G waveform. And that's why we need tight synchronization here because of the disaggregation, virtualized ORAN. On top of that, 5G come now with support of time sensitive network. As you see in one of my slides, we talk about 5G support of time sensitive network. So the support of time sensitive network application like industrial automation, internet of things, uh, um, ultra reliable and low latency communication wouldn't be possible without the use of a very tight and, um, and secure solution, which would be the lattice ORAN solution stack and the IEEE 1588. So these are all application why a wide application in the 5G and the ORAN space, why you need a very uh, tight and reliable and low power uh, solution stack. Uh, when it comes to low power, even the ORAN comes with different SKU nowadays. So we have what we call a small cell. We have a Bico cell. We have a micro cell. We have macro cell. And one of the small cell, for example, can be installed uh, on a street light and it's, about, it's powered mainly by battery. So you need the solution, uh, the ORAN base station here is required to consume very low power. So this solution stack will give you this promise. Now you have a tight synchronization, secure synchronization, and at the same time, low power consumption uh, by the latest FBG. Okay, thanks, Osam. Uh, I think we may have time for another quick question. So uh, the another, one of the other questions which is coming up, I know we have been talking about security, and we have been talking about ORAN Alliance work in security, uh, working group 11. So, so this question is around like, what is next big thing, uh, focus area for working group, group 11 security charter? And maybe that question, I uh, think Doug, you can maybe help to answer this one. Sure. And <clears throat> so examples are right now, we're working on our next release, uh, which will be very shortly. Uh, we have 40 change requests that are across the various groups. So it's still very active finishing up the specifications, making sure we have everything covered in the risk assessment. Um, but the next big focus is going to be testing. Um, you know, it, it's already ongoing, but, you know, the certification and interoperability really has to be honed and, and, and made more uh, reproducible exactly how we're going to test it and verify it and how to enforce uh, the specs. Um, also, uh, ORAN has set up a next generation ORAN, and that next generation, we're basically looking at 
how to improve the speeds, where the bottlenecks, um, ha where the security holes are, um, how to reorient interfaces and open things up even more, and, and, and basically then the effects that would have on security and other aspects. So it has that a forward looking view uh, and the work continues. It'll be a continuous improvement. <laughs> Oh, no, that's perfect. Thank you so much. And I know there are other uh, questions which are there. And uh, because of the limitation in time, we will uh, help to answer some of those questions uh, via email and follow up with you specifically. Uh, and if you can always reach us out if there's any other further questions regarding the session. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining uh, today's session. And uh, uh, as you enjoy the later part of uh, Lattice Dev uh, Developers Conference, there are other uh, communication track uh, which you may find interesting. Actually, one of the other sessions which we are talking about is specifically about Lattice uh, Value Addition for the small cell, next generation is small cell solutions, which you may find interesting and the other, uh, other sessions as well. So thank you again for joining and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.